It's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. I was just thinking about how difficult life must have been for the women. Just the job of washing clothes for a dozen or so people would have been difficult without any running water. How did they manage this in the winter months? Poor old now Gibson. I've seen her many a time down here on Blackwater Creek washing her clothes. She had her a big block of wood where she'd lay her clothes after she got them out of the creek. She'd take a great big long stick and beat them. They called that a battling stick. I used to make battling sticks for Mama. She didn't have a kettle for heating the water. No, she just washed them in the creek. She'd use a little homemade lye soap and then she'd beat them and every time she hit them, why the water would fly in all directions. My mother always heated her water outside in them big iron kettles. Then she would lay them out and beat them with the battling sticks. What did they do about washing if the creek was frozen and they didn't have a kettle to wash their clothes in? During the cold snowy months, they just didn't do any washing. What few clothes they had, they just wore right on most all winter. And them so greasy and dirty that they would stand up by themselves might near it. When they beat the clothes with those sticks, how did they keep from breaking the buttons? Ha! Ha! They didn't have no buttons. Back then, we had little wooden pegs made out of pine to hold the clothes on. If you forgot to take them out when you washed, you'd break every one of them. I never seed any buttons till Grandpa Stewart made them. He made them out of cow horns. He'd go far and near to get him some cow horns to make buttons. He had him a little compass that he used to mark them out with, and then he'd take his knife and whittle them out. He used a little drill to make the eyes. Why, he used buttons in place of money. If somebody worked for him or if they helped Grandma in the garden, he'd pay them in buttons, sometimes. I understand that cow horns were also used to make combs. I've seen Grandpap and Pap both make combs out of cow's horns. They'd split the horn and boil it and get it right soft. It was just like rubber, and they would mash it plumb flat. They'd split one end of a log and pry it open till they could get that flattened horn in it. Then they'd take the wedge out and that log would come back together and hold that horn flat till it dried out. Then it would stay that way. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. The log served as a vise. That's what it was, a vise, to hold that horn flat. After they took it out, they'd take a saw and cut it into small pieces. Then they'd cut the teeth with the saw and finish it up with a file. Pat made what they called a tucking comb. Women drew their hair up on top of their head in a ball and they'd use this comb to hold it. Called it a tucking comb. Oh, law, they thought they's flying when they got themselves one of them tucking combs. Once while sorting through a load of relics I had bought in Calborn County, Tennessee, I found a short section of what I first thought was an ordinary rope, but it had an unusual look and it didn't appear to be made from either cotton, hemp, or other familiar material. Its basic components did not appear to be threads, but rather appeared to be pliable splinters of wood. I had never heard of a wooden rope, nor had any of the authorities with whom I conferred. None of my reference books or research materials mentioned it, but when I found another piece of wooden rope in western North Carolina, it occurred to me that I hadn't consulted with the ultimate authority, Alex. I asked him if he had ever heard of a wooden rope. Grandpa Stewart used to make wooden ropes. He'd cut a hackberry tree or an elm tree and put it in a small creek or spring branch to let it soak. He wouldn't put it in a big creek for fear it would get washed away. He'd leave it there several weeks and let it get water seasoned. When he got good and soaked, he would just take his fingers and get a little string of that wood grain right at the end of the log. He would start pulling and that string of wood would follow the grain for the full length of the log. He'd keep doing that until he had enough of them strings to plait together and make him a rope. He could make it as big as he wanted to. He'd make some awful big ropes that they used to tie them double log rafts up of a night down here on the river. It sure took a powerful rope to hold them rafts when the tide was up. 
How about wooden water pipes? Do you remember them? My great uncle, old Will Turner, put in a water line from the ridge all the way down to where he lived on Caney Sinks. It was a half mile or more, and he made wooden pipes to carry it. He took pine poles about eight or ten feet long and bored holes with a long auger. He made them so one end would fit in the other, and they wouldn't leak a drop after they got wet and swelled up. He had that water run right into his house. It was gravity fed and it run all the time, day and night. Alex, I've got a few unrelated questions dealing with the very early old time ways. First, I wanted to ask you if any people had access to newspapers. The first newspaper I ever heard of was called the Hancock Times. It was a small paper, just two sheets to it, and it cost 15 cents a year. I started taking it when I was about nine years old and took it for years. It finally got to where it would cost 75 cents a year, and I dropped it. People on the ridge found out that I took that paper, and they's all the time coming here to beg me out of newspapers. Most of the people couldn't read, could they? No, they wasn't wanting them to read. They used them to paste up on the inside of their houses to keep the cold air out. They wasn't anything any better than newspapers to shut out the air from them old log houses. It helped the looks of them, too. So they'd use it for wallpaper. What did they use for glue? We'd take flour and mix it with water and make a paste. The mice would get in there between the paper and the logs and eat that paste if you didn't keep after them. You could see them working in behind that paper. We'd take sharp sticks and jab them. I've killed many a one that way. There's a very old fiddle tune called Leather Breeches, and it seems that I've heard that some of the pioneers wore these. Did you ever hear of that? I recollect that my great-grandfather Levisy wore a pair of leather breeches. It seems like they was horse leather, but I can't be for sure. When I was a child, my grandfather Rice had what we called a fox horn. He would never allow us to blow it because it was used as a means of communicating with the neighbors, and any blast on it had a certain meaning. Did your people use that method of communicating? We had a great long horns made from cow horn. We used them if somebody got hurt bad or was real bad sick or if we had a fire. We had a certain toot to alarm the neighbors and they'd come running to help out. We used them to call the hands into dinner from the fields. You had a certain kind of toot, toot for that. Mama wouldn't allow me to get out and just blow it for the fun of it. She lectured us good on that, not to give out any false alarms. We talked earlier about branding cattle before there were any fence laws, back when there was open range. Do you remember when barbed wire first came in? Yes, sir. I remember when the first barbed wire came into this country. Old Lou Trent had gone down to Knoxville and bought some and was putting it in at his place. There was a feller that lived on Lou's place named Lou Castle, and he was putting that wire up. I thought them jaggers looked dangerous. People come from all over this country to look at that barbed wire. It looked funny to me. Most of the household items that we have today, according to what you've told me, were non-existent when you were growing up, simple things that we take for granted, like clocks and watches. I remember the first watch ever I seed. George Ball made liquor, and somebody came by and traded him a watch for that liquor. I thought that was the greatest thing that ever was. He's the only man in the country that had a watch. He'd go to town and he'd pull that watch out every little bit to wind it up, and it was a sight to hear people talk about that. When you were a boy, did you ever have wild animals for pets? I've raised squirrels and groundhogs, but coons make the best pets. I've had two or three, but one pet coon I kept for a long time. I raised it from a baby, and it slept in a box in the corner of the house. If I come in with a pocket full of chestnuts, it would smell them and take them out of my pockets. He would sit on my shoulder all the time if I let him. He could take his paws and part my hair the same as you could. He was a lot of trouble to tend to, and I finally turned him loose one spring. I marked his ear, and that fall I was hunting up there in the ridge, and my dog killed a big coon, and when I examined it, I saw that it was my pet. I always hated that. 
At a little past midnight on the morning of January 20th, 1985, the temperature stood at 21 below zero at the museum. There was a spirited wind, which according to the U.S. Weather Bureau, created a chill factor of more than 50 below zero. I was checking on some of the livestock when I heard what sounded like the sharp report of a rifle in the nearby woods, followed by a similar sound in a different section of the woods. Almost immediately, it occurred to me that what I'd heard was a tree freezing and literally exploding. I vaguely remembered hearing my grandfather talk about timber freezing, but this was the first time I'd heard it myself. It is caused, I understand, by a combination of very cold weather and by a relatively high concentration of sap in the tree. A few days before, the weather had been unseasonably warm, and I thought the warm spell might have caused the sap to rise a little. While pondering this unusual phenomenon, it occurred to me that Alex would shed some light on the subject. The next time I saw him, I raised the question. Did you ever hear trees freezing and bursting? I've heard that many a time way back yonder. I've been out in the woods on right cold times and heard the timber a-popping and a-cracking, but it was winter back then. We don't have the winters, nothing like we used to have. Does that damage the trees? Yeah, it hurts them a sight. It causes them to be what they call wind shaking. Alex, I know that wind shaking timber is no good for lumber. It just falls apart and separates when you cut it. But I confess, I thought it was caused by high winds. No, wind won't hurt your timber much. It will just spring this away and that away, you see. But that freezing just pulls it apart. Any tree from a foot on up will freeze if it gets cold enough and if there's enough sap in it. There's more sap in late winter. It starts rising a little and every time the moon news, the sap comes up and when the moon gets old, the sap goes down. Some trees are worse than others to freeze. Hickory is about the worst to get froze and wind shaken of any tree there is. We bought a boundary of timber off of Dave Johnson up here and there was 30 or 40 hickories on it that was just plumb two and three feet thick. We'd cut them and they'd just fall apart. They was wind shook and they weren't fit for anything. Once a tree gets wind shook, it stays that way. It won't grow back. It's no count. When I visited Alex one spring morning in the early 1960s, he was sitting in front of his barn, work shed, in the warm sun working on some small item I could hardly see. He seemed elated to have company, as he always did. I asked him what he was making. Now you tell me, he said with a grin on his face. Do you know what it is? He asked, holding up a curved bone-like item about three inches long. Well, I think that's one of those famous coon toothpicks. They call them Arkansas toothpicks, don't they? He laughed heartily. That's right. Now, how did you know that? They're made from a coon's privates. And you actually use them as toothpicks? Oh, yeah, that's what they're used for. I used them for 12 months out of the year to pick my teeth. All I've got now is secondhand false teeth, so I don't need toothpicks anymore. I had one here one time, and I'd taken a babbit and mailed it down and put it on the big end. I made a knob of it, and it looked pretty. There's a woman come here one day and see that, and she said, Well, what do you take for that? Said, I've always wanted one of them. Well, I said, You can have it if you want it, and she just seemed tickled to death. It sort of plagued me when I found out what she wanted. The word plagued, as used here, means to embarrass. This was the first and I believe the only time I heard Alex use it, but I heard it used occasionally in southern Appalachia before by, among others, my father and his brothers. If I'd have known she's coming, I'd have hid it, but it didn't bother her at all. Chapter 17, Alex Becomes a Celebrity I never did believe in getting all docked up just because company was coming. Alex was 53 years old when he moved on his new farm on Panther Creek. He soon built himself a house and for the next 20 years cultivated his bottom land farm, operated his sawmill, and spent a little more time fishing and hunting. Then when he was in his 70s, he went back to the mountain crafts and pioneer activities which was to bring him fame and notoriety. 
tell me about getting started on your new farm on Panther Creek. After I got the farm paid for, it took about all the money I had. I noticed that these bottoms down there was teetotally covered with this old yellow dock. I had to plow the bottom anyhow to plant corn, so as I plowed it, I had the boys dig and pick out the roots of that yellow dock. People up and down the creek made fun of us. Well, we shipped it to North Carolina and got 10 cents a pound for it. We sold over $200 worth that summer. Did you build the house? The boys helped and we built it ourselves. I made me a wagon and hooked my mules to it and went up there on the mountain and got the logs. We hauled them to the sawmill and had them sawed. Then I hauled the lumber down to Sneedville and had it planed and sized. Supplies were scarce about that time, weren't they, because of the war? That was towards the end of the war and you couldn't hardly buy anything. The nails and tin was the biggest thing I needed to buy anyhow, and I had to go way up in Kentucky to find them. Where do you get your water? It comes from back over on the second ridge from here. I was up there squirrel hunting one day, and I come to this big spring. It belonged to Singletary Johnson, one of Margie's uncles. I got down on my knees and got me a good drink, and I thought that was the best drinking water I ever tasted. It was cold and clear and had them little pennywinkles in it. You know what they are, don't you? I stood there and looked at that spring and I said to myself, that water can be put down to my house. I said, I'll put it down there, and I did. I run me a pipe from up there and we have all that good spring water run right in there in the house and it don't cost me a penny. I let seven other families around here have water, and it don't cost them anything either. It's all gravity fed. The happen chance manner in which I met Alex has already been discussed. From the time of that first meeting, Alex started making various old time items which I bought for the museum. He started out with staved pieces such as churns, tubs, buckets, and piggins. When one of us thought of some other long forgotten item, he would have it made by the time I next visited him. He made dough trays, scrub brooms, bowls of various types, rolling pins, mouth bows, billies, chairs, baby cradles, fish traps, whiskey stills, and crossbows, to mention a few. A very few older folks in the community remembered Alex Stewart, the old-time craftsman, but most of his neighbors were seeing a new and exciting side of the old farmer on Panther Creek. People began to notice some of Alex's handiwork, which was on display in the museum. Among those who observed and admired these artistic creations was Bill Henry, the noted whittler and craftsman of Oak Ridge. Bill, who is my longtime friend, was employed by Union Carbide Corporation, but he had a most profound interest and appreciation for the Appalachian region and its people. He grew up in the stark coal mining camps of East Tennessee and Kentucky and is no stranger to mountain people and their ways. From the time Bill first saw Alex's work, he wanted to meet him. He got that chance in October 1966 at the Southern Highland Craftsman Fair in Gatlinburg, where Alex had gone for a visit with two Vista workers, Mike and Ann Hughes. Although Alex was old enough to have been Bill's grandfather, the two craftsmen became fast friends and Bill became a frequent visitor to the Stewart home place. In the fall of 1975, the East Tennessee Craft Council arranged for Bill to serve a four-week apprenticeship with Alex. He received a leave of absence from Union Carbide and the Tennessee Valley Authority financed the program. Bill described these events as a dream come true. Commenting on his memorable stay, Bill said, I moved in with Alex and Mutt on January 19th, 1976 for a four-week adventure that I shall never forget. Alex's shop was a half-enclosed shed on the old barn that stood some 200 yards behind the house. It was a delight to the senses. The dirt floor was always ankle-deep in cedar shavings, and chickens cackled and crowed in the hayloft, and cows mooed in the adjoining stables. From the open end of the shed, one had a full view of the log corn crib, the black blacksmith shop, and the sawmill. Beyond that lay the fertile meadows of Panther Creek, and beyond that, Indian Ridge. It was in this primitive and picturesque setting that the two worked and talked day after day. 
On very cold days, when the temperature hovered near zero, they would work by the fire in Alex's little room inside the house. Bill asked questions, listened, and learned, and he came to admire his mentor more each day. The following are excerpts from the daily journal which Bill kept during the month he spent there. Alex is a good cook and does all his cooking on a big wood-burning stove. He bakes biscuits every morning, and if they're not all eaten, he dips them in water at noon and heats them in the oven. They taste as good as freshly baked. He is a wonderful teacher, and he takes his job seriously, but he is always jovial, always displaying a sense of humor. One morning, I was washing the dishes while he swept the kitchen. I started to move out of his way, and he said, that's all right, Billy. You don't have to move. I'm just sweeping out the big things so we won't stump our toes on them. At the end of his stay, Bill made a long entry in his journal. He described Alex as being as good a man as ever came down the pike. He is curious as a cat, tough as a pine knot, independent as a hog on ice, industrious as a honeybee, and as handy as the pocket on your shirt. He is also a bit of a paradox, frugal as a Scotchman, yet he would give you the shirt off his back. If you gave him just cause, he'd knock you down, then help you up and dust you off. He has a big heart as big as all the outdoors and a mind like a sponge, absorbing everything with which it comes in contact. My very dear friend, Alex Stewart. And then he said, if we had men with his qualities of integrity, frugality, and good sense in positions of authority, our nation wouldn't be in the shape it's in. Alex enjoyed the relationship quite as much as Bill. After all, his greatest delight in life was helping others. He talked of their association with fondness. Bill stayed here a month and one day. Oh, we had a time together. I made him a shaven horse, turning lathe, and the whole outfit. That liked to have tickled him to death. We named the shaven horse Old Silver. I believe he said he'd been offered $75 for it, said he wouldn't take 100 for it. I told him that was a mighty high horse. He learned the trade pretty good, and he got to where he could make about anything, but he had to go back to work down there at Oak Ridge, and he slowed down on his making buckets, piggins, and churns. He's retired, I believe, from his job, and I expect that he'll go back to making things again. Alex turned 85 that January, 1976, and he was already gaining widespread fame. In commemoration of his birthday, he received letters or telegrams from Governor Blanton, Senator Howard Baker, Senator Bill Brock, Congresswoman, Marilyn Lloyd, and Congressman Jimmy Quillen. He had scores of visitors who, in addition to his members of his family, included several friends and admirers from Knoxville, Oak Ridge, and other East Tennessee communities. He was delighted by the turnout. He willingly posed for pictures, held the babies, kissed the women, donned a big black wig and a Mexican sombrero, and played several tunes on the mouth bow. Then he blew out all 85 candles on the cake his daughter Edith had baked for him. In 1976, Alex and Bill Henry were invited to participate in the Festival of American Folklore in Washington, D.C., some felt that the ordeal might be too much for Alex, but he was determined to go. He later said, I meant to go if I had to come home in a box. He said he'd always wanted to go to Washington and see all them foreigners. Tell me about the first time you went to Washington. They come and got me and took me up there and I stayed with them seven days. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I liked it all right. They so good to me, I couldn't help but like it. I was never treated better in my life. I wasn't used to it. Made me ashamed that they treated me so good. Never thought about getting a penny out of it or nothing. I took a tray I'd made, a bucket and a piggin with me. I was to work three hours of every day while I was there, and they's a given me $25 a day. They come to me and said, work if you want to, and if you don't, you don't have to. Said, you've done enough work already for people to see how it's done. Take your time, and if you want to run about, go on. They took me all over Washington, took me out to where Kennedy was buried, and took me to where all the money was being made. Showed me the first money that was ever discovered in the United States, and a rock off the moon. Boy, I don't know what all. 
They kept me on the road all the time. When I first went to the Smithsonian, they come running out to meet me. I wondered how come they all knowed who I was. And then I looked around and there was a life-size picture of me. The life-size colored photograph of Alex was actually at the National Geographic Society's headquarters. Did you see the president while you were there? When I got back home, a heap of folks asked me about that. I told them that I could have, but that I got to studying and said to myself, if I go in there to see the president, he'll ask me every question in the world. He'll want to know where I'm from and what's my occupation. He'd see that big badge I had on that said I was a cooper, and he'd come down home aggravating me to death, wanting to learn that trade, and I just decided I didn't want to be bothered. If I had seen him, I would have just seen another man, and I've seen thousands of them. I'd rather see you any time than the president. Who was the president then? Johnson. I didn't see him, but I saw the White House all right. I had seen it on money so much, I wanted to see it to see if they had it right. They was exactly right. Not long after I got home, the president sent me a birthday card. Yeah, he sure did. They brought me in the mail one day, and I come to this big square envelope that didn't have no return address on it. I thought it was an old company letter or some kind of insurance, and I just throwed it back on the table. A little later on, I said, I'll just open it up to see what you are, and it was from the president. Where did you stay when you were in Washington? I boarded at the Alexander Hotel. Was you ever out to his hotel? It's built out of rock. I believe, and it's got 600 rooms in it. I slept in the sixth story. I believe that was your first plane ride. Tell me about it. When we first got ready to get on the plane, they had people there to investigate us to see what we was carrying on. The bells went off when I went past them, and they found out I was carrying a knife. They asked me if I had anything else in my pocket, and I said, yeah, and I pulled out a big twist of homemade chewing tobacco and offered that feller a chew. He told me to go on through. That liked to have tickled Bill to death. After I got on the plane, I looked up in front where they had all the machinery and everything that run the plane. The whole thing was just filled up with buttons where they operated everything. I was peeping in, and one of them men in there grabbed me and said, I'll bet you're wanting to see in here. I says, yeah, that's what I was wanting. He took me in and showed me all the buttons and gadgets and what they was used for. We got up there 5,000 and some feet, and we run into a big storm, and we had to cut around it, go through a big hole, they called it. They told us to put our belts on that it might shake us up a little. Well, we got through that hole, and I never noticed it when we went through. That made us five minutes late getting into Washington. And the trip didn't cost you very much? From the time I left home till the time I got back, it cost me 15 cents. I got thirsty one day, and I went over and bought me a Coca-Cola. It cost me 15 cents, and that was every penny that trip cost me. Fascinating thinking about Alex going all the way to Washington and flying on a plane and staying in the hotel and getting drove around. Uh, really telling there the part where he's he's peeking into the cockpit to see what's going on. Again, you can see his curiosity. That's why he knew so much about life. He was curious about everything and, and kind of not afraid to learn about it. I like how this part of the book started out about the washing clothes. I'm so thankful for my washer and dryer. I can't imagine how hard it must have been to wash clothes, whether you were doing it in a creek or, um, you know, with kettles hauling water from the spring or the well or whatever you had. Um, if you've heard my some of my interviews with Mrs. Hicks, she talks about that. She talks about when in my last video, I will link to that about about having to go down to the creek and wash clothes and how she boiled them and how what she did. She tells details about it. It's really really fascinating. And kind of a funny thing about that, the other day me and Paul was talking, my brother Paul was talking about something else about Pap, and I don't even remember how this come up, but he said Pap told him, of course, he served in the military, was in the Marines, and he was on a big ship carrier uh, for a long time, a big ship, uh, aircraft carrier, for a long time. And he told, Pap told him that some of, at that time, that some of the boys would tie all their clothes together and then throw them behind the ship. So then as the ship went, it, you know, think about the ocean and the waves and the dragon behind the ship, it washed their clothes. Pap said the only bad thing is if, 
you know, if it come undone or something happened to them, you'd have no clothes. Uh, so I'd never heard that story. Paul was telling me that the other day. Really more interesting knowledge shared in this one. The ropes, how do you make a rope out of wood? That is fascinating. And fascinating to me that, I mean, amazing that those ropes, I mean, somebody used them, but then they lasted long enough that then John Rice Irwin found them when he was looking for stuff to put in his museum. So amazing. Amazing about the buttons, about his grandpa making the buttons, and then that they used them for money. That was really interesting, that he would pay them in money, in, in other words. I guess that's no different than um, if somebody helped you out and you paid them with, you know, they could cut some more trees off your property for, for wood or whatever like that. But it's just interesting that it was actually buttons that they were using. Also, that part still fascinating is them making the combs from the cow's horn. So interesting. And I love how Alex, all through the book, he's, if something like that they're talking about, like for the women wearing them as tucking combs, he called it, he'll make little comments like, and boy, they thought they was something, you know, when they got that. It was really something special. We have so much today living in the land of plenty, it's hard to believe that just having a comb to tuck your hair in uh, would really make you think you were something. Today, most of us could just go to the store and buy them. Most of us today in our cabinets, in our bathroom, maybe we have two bathrooms, and in both bathrooms, there's two or three combs um, that you'd comb your hair with. And I, I know that somewhere I have some of those tucking combs because I used to use them in my hair when I had longer hair, and I'm sure I never threw them away. Mine were not handmade. Mine were plastic. Uh, but still really amazing to think about all the things that they figured out how to make on their own. The elaborate water system was also really interesting. Now, when I was growing up here where I live in Wilson Holler, we had gravity water, Pap and Granny did, until I was, in, I think I was in eighth grade when Pap finally had a well drilled. So our water come from way up the creek at a spring, and it was, instead of wooden pipe, like Alex is talking about, it was just pipe. And it in places, of course, Pap tried to bury it as much as he could so that, um, you know, it wouldn't freeze in the wintertime. But there's some places it just couldn't be buried so you could see it, you know, sticking out. It was wonderful water. It did freeze. That was the downside of size downside of it and, and kind of in those last years I could perhaps not hear anymore but I'm sure that's probably what finally made him decide to um, drill a well we went through a really cold several years there where it froze a lot during the winter and I'm sure as he got older he got tired of fooling with it we would we didn't leave ours running all the time like Alex was talking about but on cold nights pap and granny always the water would be running in the sink in the kitchen and also running in the bathroom just a little bit but enough to try to help it you know to prevent it from freezing overnight I like the part about the fox horn. Again, today we all have are tethered, most of us, to a cell phone. So if you want to call somebody, if you need help, if you want to call your neighbor, call your mom, I call whoever, you just pick up your phone and call. But in those days where there was no phone, but you still needed to be in contact with people, especially in case of an emergency, that's really interesting that they used the, the horn and the fox horn, which was really like a cow horn. Uh, to blow in and that they had different toots as Alex was describing it and you would hear that and know that means dang, you know that means something's wrong or that means whatever reminds me of also in those days uh, Pap told me that in this area I never really heard him talk about nobody blowing a horn but that church bells would ring and, and they would ring those church bells uh, if it was during the week or something like that when someone passed away. The toll of the bell, they would, be, they would ring the bell for ever how old the person was that died. So Pap said that would kind of give you a, a general you know, guess because you were, there wasn't as many people and you kind of knew, well, so-and-so's been really sick or whatever, and you, you might be able to kind of guess before you heard, well, that's, they're ringing it for, you know, old man Johnson finally passed away or whatever. So that's the other thing. And also um, dinner bells, you know, ringing the dinner bell. And other people would use that if you cl just keep clanging it and clanging it and clanging it to allow people, alert people that something might be wrong. Granny has one on her porch, and sometimes Pap, when, after he was retired, he'd slip off down to Paul's down the hill and be down there picking the guitar or something. And if she wanted to tell him, not that something was wrong, but tell him that uh, dinner was ready or supper was ready or something, she would, she would ring that bell for him, and you could hear it. you hear it all through the holler. One other thing that I thought was really interesting in this part of the book, and I'm going to try it definitely, 
but I liked the part when Bill's talking, the man that come and apprenticed with Alex is talking about his cooking and talking about how good his biscuits are. And then he said if any was left over that he would dip them in water and then heat them up. Now I've certainly heated biscuits. We eat leftovers always. I usually heat mine in a toaster oven slice them in two and maybe put some butter in them and heat them like that but i'm going to try that and we'll try dipping them in water and then putting them back in the oven and see if they really do taste like like fresh baked i'm going to try that one so i'll try to remember if i try it to to share with you and see if it actually worked like bill described so i hope you enjoyed this part of the book we have one more one more section so be sure to drop back by next Friday because that will be the last installment installment of this reading of Alex Stewart, Portrait of a Pioneer. After that, we will have to find another book. I will continue to read. A lot of people have been asking that. So I have a few options floating around in my mind, and I will solidify them. And um, Next week will be the, the last of Alex, and then the following week we will start a new book.